Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. No problem. Okay. And did my screen freeze again or not? Okay. Um, so as I as was commenting, we are using um, the ClearGov uh, platform for assembling the uh, the budget, and the, all the background materials from the different uh, departments can be found um, on this on this platform. You'll see um, Andrea sent out a, an email around six this evening, uh, giving you um, access to the, the digital budget booklet. Um, but in addition to the booklet, there is background information that we will also be giving you access to. Um, so the, the booklet is um, expanded from years past in terms of additional information and, and graphs comparing uh, you know, the current year to the proposed year. And you're able to do some additional comparisons based on the materials that are available um, on the ClearGov platform. Um, so I'm hopeful that you'll find this um, uh, very helpful to you, and we'll look forward to your comments as to uh, how we can make it uh, as, a, as easy and accessible um, to you as we proceed with, um, with the process. Um, but we are optimistic that this will be a good platform for us as we, as we move forward. Um, so any questions on, uh, on the ClearGov and accessing it? How do we access it other than what I got was a PDF? Right, so and Andrea will be sending additional login information and how you can get into um, some of the background materials that are also available online. Okay, thank you. So yes, we'll be sending out um, additional instructions on that. Greg, will this be um, available to the public as well, the access to this? Um, yes, it can be, yes. And how would they go about getting access? So again, we'll, we'll, we'll put on the, on the web page a budget page that people can click on to enter into the, some of the information that's available. Great, thank you. And just jump in when I, if I'm not saying something correct. <laughs> um, so let me start out as I like to do with sort of the, the big picture and in terms of our projections for next year, uh, obviously a work in progress and much work still to be done, but nonetheless, where we are today um, in the proposed FY23 budget um, coming in at a total of just under 39 million and breaking that down into its major components, you can see on, on the screen, 18.8 .8 million for the, for the regional district and for the vocational school, um, about um, 200,000 for the vocational school, the rest for our regional, um, regional school. Uh, 12.4 million for town operations, um, all the departments except for um, the enterprise funds, water and sewer, which are listed separately at 1.7. Um, capital expenditures um, have increased this year. We're tapping some additional reserves from the uh, water department in particular to go um, a little higher on our um, capital expenditures. Um, that that 3.6 figure does not include a proposed um, bond, which we'll get into when we get into capital, um, using uh, community preservation funds to help fund the two new athletic fields, uh, Sweeney uh, upgrade renovation and also the burn dump. Um, but more to come on that later. Um, the rest of debt payments um, are at a million even, uh, roughly. And then as I said, the enterprise funds at 1.7, uh, community preservations are assumed at about 0.6, just to keep it where it was um, in the current year for easy comparison, but that'll depend on um, recommendations from the Community Preservation Committee and the different uh, um, applications that they will be reviewing. And then just under a million for various state assessments, our OPEB payments and um, uh, abatements for, um, for, for uh, appeals to tax 
uh, tax bills. Um, so in total, all total, that's a $38.9 million worth of expenditures. So overall, it's up about 2.6% from um, current year expenditures. Um, I always like to just take a minute to, to give you a, a very a quick overview of what all of this buys you in terms of the services that, that are delivered. Um, again, I don't need to read all of these lines, but just an array of quick samples of the various services that are provided, um, the water and sewer utilities, in terms of the 200 million gallons of water uh, processed for, for drinking and also processed for cleaning it before it gets put back into the environment. Um, plowing and de-icing roads, uh, trash, tax bills, et cetera, et cetera. Um, again, just a sampling, but a lot of services being provided um, day in and day out. And um, again, I'll just take a minute to applaud staff in um, continuing to provide all these services um, despite COVID and, and the various challenges that COVID has provided us over the last couple of years now. Um, but we have provided all these services uh, without interruption um, despite those additional challenges. So my, my hat's off to staff for for continuing to provide all these services um, without, without skipping a beat. So um, quite, quite well done. So obviously with any budget, a lot of assumptions behind the numbers. Um, so some of the assumptions being made are that citizens want the current level of services that we're providing. They don't wanna see any decrease in those services. Um, we assume that taxpayers are willing to accept a, a two and a half percent hike in taxes. Uh, we, we lowered that uh, in, in 20 with COVID um, and a little less uh, in the current year. But this going forward in FY23, we are assuming that uh, taxpayers are willing to accept um, the more traditional two and a half percent tax hike in order to keep services where they have been. Um, this assumes also that we um, level fund our total exclusions, debt or capital exclusions, um, or use of extra levy capacity. So this current year, for example, um, instead of actually voting a separate uh, capital exclusion, we have uh, excess levy capacity that we could tap and it, it accomplishes the same end in terms of um, tax impacts, uh, but it's just a slightly different approach um, and, and doesn't require that extra vote for the, um, that a capital exclusion vote does. Um, but it has the same impact in terms of taxes. Uh, we continue a fairly aggressive funding of, of infrastructure, infrastructure needs, as I mentioned, um, um, accelerating it a bit with some use of water reserves that have built up. And we are anticipating and hope that we will be able to tap into a number of new uh, grant opportunities that are that are opening up both at the state and federal level. Um, uh, the state uh, through its ARPA funds are, are putting additional monies into uh, into water and sewer infrastructure as well as some climate resiliency uh, along with a list of other items. Um, and then the federal infrastructure bill is also getting um, rolled out though we're still waiting for the, uh, the details on how to access those funds. Um, but we are anticipating being able to accelerate some of our capital needs if we are successful in getting some of those infrastructure dollars. Um, there are some adjustments in, in a few departments uh, based on some higher demands, in particular, uh, the Harbor Master, um, a, a small bump in, in conservation because of um, about a 50% increase in, in permitting activity. Um, and we do need to talk about some additional uh, pressures in, in public safety and public, uh, public health and public safety both. Um, so health, fire and police, which will be discussions um, as, we, as we go through this budget. Um, uh, goal of this budget is to um, uh, get some assistance with mapping out a long-term facilities needs and use of town properties. So where, where should we make a definitive decisions about um, DPW garage and if we are going to either 
uh, build on a new site or renovate and expand on the existing site? What's the long-term game plan for public safety and for town hall and, and senior center? And see if we can get a, a clear roadmap going forward um, up for those various needs and what uh, resources and, and town lands we have to use. Um, obviously, we want to continue to maintain um, our strong fiscal condition in terms of maintaining our AAA bond rating and uh, maintaining our reserves at that targeted level, which is in that 10% range. Um, and so we are able to dip into that because we are a bit over that um, at this point. So just a little bit on some of the key challenges. Uh, again, these are, um, are not all that new. We've been uh, talking about these challenges and we need to make some decisions now. Um, certainly in, in public safety, what is the appropriate um, size and operations for the town? So we have talked at length about uh, the public safety dispatch. So we uh, need to make a decision um, in the next few months on that question. Um, a decision maybe to put it before the voters, but nonetheless a decision as to how to uh, move forward. Um, if, if the decision is to keep uh, dispatch in-house, then we will need to increase um, some resources, both on the capital and operating side. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the budget as it's crafted today in this, uh, which rolled out here, does assume some additional hours um, in the Harbor Master, um, but we need to talk more about the health department in terms of its hours. Um, so again, on capital, uh, we continue to um, hit that 3 million plus target, um, which, is, which is good. We, as I say, are hoping to accelerate um, using some, some reserve, additional reserves and also tapping into some of the, the new grant monies that are, that are available. Um, and looking down the road, we, we really need to start planning on um, projects that will make us more resilient to the impacts of climate change. Um, bigger storms, surging seas, uh, we face um, a number of challenges in order to protect us and make us more resilient in, in light of those changes. Um, and obviously the third one, no surprise, is managing the school district budget and how that impacts um, either taxes or the rest of our budgets. Um, they struggled to keep um, you know, in that range of 3.25 to 375. Um, their <clears throat> tentative budget they'll present tomorrow night uh, during a public hearing. Um, they will be targeting a, a three and a half percent increase overall. Um, that's prior to adjustments for apportionment. And so we'll, we'll hear those um, apportionment figures tomorrow. Um, but the 3.5 uh, doesn't allow them to do what they think they should be doing. So there are challenges there. And, um, and there's already talk about the, the need for the third major capital project on the school level, that being the, the Essex Elementary School project. Um, the timing of that uh, obviously will have a, a significant impact um, on taxes. Um, if we can wait until we are close to retiring the high school um, debt, uh, which is in uh, early th 30s, then the impact of that new the, the third project, the elementary school in Essex would, would have a much lower impact on, on everyone's um, tax burdens. Um, so those are, as I say, we've been talking about these three major challenges. They haven't changed that much. They're still with us and we still need to, um, to deal with that. So in looking at um, new revenues for next year, so again, assuming this walks us through those, those new revenues, if we assume a 2.5% increase, um, about 685,000 in, in, in new revenues there, um, new growth came in, uh, um, we're up at 175 this year, which was higher than what we budgeted. So we're using that number again for next year. I'm always a little bit of a, a guessing game, um, but um, as I drove around town today watching a house being torn down completely and a new house going to be put up, um, that, that helps our, our tax base. Um, 
So it does seem to be a healthy amount of, of additions, renovations um, continuing on in town. Um, I do show a very slight dip in, in local receipts. Um, state aid probably might come in a little higher than level, maybe 5,000 over what we currently are getting, um, but not, uh, not a big change there. Um, enterprise fees, again, two and a half percent increase on those fees, bringing in 16,000. Um, as I was indicating, a, a little higher use of reserves, um, mainly on the water reserve, uh, 166,000 as a net, and then reallocation of some funds. So we have lower debt. And so we, as I say uh, earlier, our strategy has been to reallocate those funds towards capital. Um, so including the reallocated funds, um, we have a total of, of 1.1 million, um, which is about a 2.7%, 2, 2 I think it's a 2.6 earlier, 2.7% increase in, um, in funds. So where, where hey, might those go? Hey, Greg. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Just quick question on the local receipts line. Do, do we know the actual for um, fiscal 2021? Yes. Yeah, that came in, um, uh, I want to say around 2.8 or 9. Um, I could double check that, but I think that's it came in right around there. 2.8 or 9. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, and so we bumped it up to 2.5 um, this past year um, and the year before. Um, so not nearly as um, conservative as we had been in the past. So where might that 1.1 million go? So this is a, a, a snapshot of where those additional dollars would be used. So for salaries, um, most contracts are calling for a 2% uh, pay hike for, for fiscal 23. Um, and there's, as I say, a, a little bit of boost in some hours. So overall, it's a 2.1 at 146,000 more. Um, health insurance, we are um, anticipating a higher increase uh, than the 3.3, but we have um, some extra capacity in that account. We've, um, um, you know, every year we, we take our best guess and we've been on the conservative side. So we don't need to raise uh, the health insurance the full seven or 8% that we're being told to anticipate. Um, Health inflation is, is back on the, on the table. Uh, we've done quite well in the last few years. Um, in fact, we had a, an actual decrease in our health insurance premium um, two years ago. Um, but this, they are telling us to anticipate uh, health costs inflating again. And as I say, we have some capacity, so we were able to absorb some of the increase. But I'm showing uh, another 44,000 or 3.3% 3, 3 increase. Um, on the pension, we're, we're facing an 8% increase, and then we also have a bump up in our OPEB uh, contribution, which is planned. So every year we, we up the, um, the OPEB contribution, that's for the retiree um, uh, health benefit that we're obligated to pay once people retire. Um, so the pension fund being managed uh, by the county system uh, is, is trying to, <coughs> excuse me, trying to catch up for those years of un underfunding. And so we still have a number of years at uh, seven and 8% increases um, before we will be fully funded in the early thirties. For operating expenses, showing a 1.75% increase overall at 70,000. Um, I have some nervousness with this number, uh, just with um, the question mark of where inflation is going. We, we haven't seen the inflationary pressures in the last few years that we are seeing right now, a um, bit of a guessing game as to where it's going next. Is it, is it a temporary transitory uh, bump um, or is it something more permanent and getting baked into, into the system? Uh, so we'll have to see how that all weighs out. Um, certainly we're seeing pressures on you know, energy costs which are significant for some of our operations. <coughs> Excuse me and um, other areas, but energy is the one I worry about the most, I think. Um, on the capital, as I say, we're bumping that up a bit. 
from the base of 3.3 up to 3.6, roughly 3.6. And then on the school side, I'm assuming um, a 3% increase. So with apportionment, they're 3.5. Um, uh, if, if the enrollment patterns uh, continue as they have in the last couple of years, um, it's during a phase where it's favoring um, us in terms of we, we pay a little less than that total overall and Essex pays a little more. Um, the, the roles were reversed. Uh, if you go a few years further back when apportionment was, was working against us and we were adding more students relative to Essex and therefore picking up a higher share of, of the increase. Um, this assumes that we're picking up a slightly lower share and that it comes in at 3%. So again, that's, that's uh, subject to change and we will see how that all, um, all comes together in the coming uh, couple of months here. Um, as I say, school, school department will be presenting uh, their preliminary budget tomorrow evening. Hey, Greg. Uh, yes. Um, on the pension and OPEB, uh, is that the, uh, the total number that goes into the ordinarily the OPEB? Um, warrant article item? No, so the, the OPEB number is around 270,000, give or take. Um, so we increase that about two and a half to three percent each year. And then the bulk of this increase, 124,000 in addition, is the bulk of that goes to pension. <clears throat> okay, so we're sticking with our, our essentially a two to four percent increase to the uh, OPEB. To OPEB. That's yeah. correct. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We're sticking with that that funding schedule that um, um, has us being fully funded again in the early 30s, maybe a little earlier if you know if we do a little better um, with with the investments um, than than estimated. Um, and so far we have. So we hope hope that continues. Um, so as I say, the uh, the budget here does include some additional hours in the, in the Harbor Master Department for additional um, on-water patrolling, uh, some small increase in hours for the uh, CONCOM staff based on increasing in permitting activity. And it also is anticipating um, a change in how we do custodial um, work. And, and this anticipates a full-time custodian versus the part-time that we have this year. Um, in creating a facility um, facility budget, and we can um, help pay for that those additional hours by covering the um, custodial needs at the at the library. Um, though the library would like to talk further about that as we um, as we get into some of the details of some of these proposals. Um, and as I indicated earlier, uh, one of the um, big decisions that we need to confront in the next couple of months is where do we want to go with staffing, um, police, fire, um, and also um, Board of Health. Um, so to back up just a minute, both the Harbor and ConCom um, extra dollars uh, can be come from their fees that they collect. So ConCom with higher permitting is bringing in additional dollars with their applications. So those additional dollars can cover um, those, those boosts and hours for the CONCOM. And similarly, the, uh, the harbor is, is, those expenses are paid for with the water, various waterway fees. Um, so it's not a, a hit to, uh, to the taxes for the general fund. Um, we are probably going to have an opportunity to do something similar um, with the Department of Health, uh, with our health department staffing. And at least for the next few years, additional state monies um, and federal dollars will be available. Uh, but again, something that we need to flush out a little more in detail. We're waiting for some of those details um, on funding to be released. They haven't released those details yet, uh, but it's this discussion that we'll need to have um, going forward. Um, uh, just to complete the list, so on, on police side, pressures from uh, police reform, um, which will most likely lead to a loss of our 
uh, many of our reserve officers because they are being required now to be um, trained to the same level as a full-time police officer. Um, so we anticipate that our reserves, once they are fully trained, will no longer want to be reserves. They're going to go off and find full-time employment. Um, and so that's going to make it difficult for us to continue to rely on reserves. And we may need to um, boost our full-time complement in the police. And then on the fire side, um, again, the challenges of, of staffing. Currently, as you know, we, we staff with three full-time firefighters. We have pretty much lost our reserve um, force, our, not our reserve force, but our call force. Um, and um, if they are back-to-back -back or simultaneous am ambulance calls, um, that's a minimum of four people that are needed to two, to, two in each ambulance to run. Um, and then there's the two in, two out standard that is highly desired for um, actual fires. Uh, so there's a real desire from, from fire to have sufficient staffing um, to provide those four, four on every shift rather than three. Um, we have one, again, I'm getting a little bit into the weeds and we'll get into this later. Um, it would require hiring three more since we have one floater now. Um, and there again, for the, for the first few years, um, that could be paid for through what's called a safer grant, um, but some decisions on that are gonna be needed sooner rather than later. And that's something we want to pursue. Um, th these are details that we will get into um, as, we, as we start meeting in January, as we review these, these proposals. Um, so this just highlights some of the changes. Uh, that are happening. I, I just talked about the staffing, I talked about pension, talked about capital. Um, we are also spending more on IT and, and software needs. Um, uh, but it, it's interesting, we, we sort of, Andrea and I both sort of asked the question, gee, I wonder how we compare. And, and coincidentally, um, uh, we're involved with the regional effort and the, the gentleman who's is heading up that, who's the IT director in Danvers, I um, had just written an article that will be appearing, appearing in the MMA uh, beacon uh, pretty soon. Um, where our, what we're spending as a percent of total budget is, is actually a bit below the norm. I was getting concerned that we were um, getting up there, but uh, relative to sort of the standards, um, we're not. It just sort of shows that we were uh, fairly, fairly low on that expenditure area. Um, but it is catching up as we... Um, with everything going to the cloud and your subscription base payments um, and making sure you have um, uh, desktops that are up to the task, uh, it's costing money. So we, we are seeing an increase in our, in our IT cost. Um, so just a bit more on, on capital. Um, this is continuing the three, three to three and a half million on a cash basis. Um, and again, we are able to, to grow that number because as we retire debt, we've um, turned that either into a capital exclusion or tapping our um, extra levy capacity to the same effect. Um, so for example, we're, our debt is dropping by, by 84,000 for next year and we can um, raise that, we can redirect that 84,000 towards capital as we retire debt. So that's enabled us to grow our annual expenditure on capital so that we are able to start catching up um, on the backlog that we've had. Um, Greg, the, do you know what that number drops to the following year? Um, that service? It, it's a similar amount. There is a big drop off in 24. 24, um, okay. And um, if, if that table isn't in the ClearGov platform, we'll, we'll get it up there. Um, it is. <coughs> it is. I just didn't have much time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so you will, we can take a deeper dive in, in terms of those year-to-year um, -year projections of debt. Um, I, I do show in the five-year plan that, that you'll see um, bonding for a new DPW facility. Obviously, we need to make a decision about where it goes and what it is. Um, but as a, um, assuming that we make those decisions, I'm showing bonding 
for a new facility in 26. Um, and we'll, we will have retired additional debt um, that we can take on that, that new debt without increasing taxation. Um, so the, without the bonding, you know, if we're doing three plus million uh, every year, um, you know, this 15 year plan shows over 45 million in, in new capital expenditures. Um, and then come the early thirties, uh, we, we retire uh, even more debt. Uh, we are almost debt free on the town side. Obviously if we include incur new debt in 26, then obviously that, that won't be the case, but it'll, it'll nonetheless, there is other debt that, that is fully retired. Um, and in addition to that, um, our, our pension and OPEB liabilities um, should be fully funded as well. Um, so those, those three items being retiring the rest of our current debt and retiring retiree liabilities, um, that frees up significant funds um, where we could be um, needing to do larger projects and bonding. And, and so if we can hold on to the early 30s, then, then we are in pretty good shape. Um, and my last comment about capital is, is the Essex Elementary, which I had mentioned earlier, um, is the third major project that the district will be looking at. Um, the, the high school debt retires in, in 34, I believe. Um, and so if, if you could hold off, uh, and, and I emphasize that if, because there are pressures there, um, if you could hold off until um, the early 30s, it would make payment of that uh, third major project on, in the school district much easier in terms of, of burdening taxpayers. Um, so all something to keep in mind as we look, look ahead in, in the multi-year plan for, for capital. So just to take a look, um, again, like to just sort of um, bring this back to the individual taxpayer or homeowner. Um, you see the, the average value of home at 1.2, uh, the median at uh, 876, uh, 67, sorry, read those backwards. Um, current property tax rate of 1060, uh, what those uh, two properties would pay in total taxation for this year, um, assuming a two and a half percent increase. What does that mean to them? So to the to the average home, that's a $330 hike in taxation and to the medium valued home, it's 230. Um, just for comparison sake, um, statewide, the average valued home is, is uh, just, just under 550 um, at a tax rate of about 1550 compared to our 1060. Um, so they're, they're paying about $8,500 and um, uh, so, oh, yeah, and the average increase is a little higher. Um, you know, those, those, when you factor in places that do overrides or have excess levy capacity, um, rather than two and a half, you, the average statewide is closer to two, 2.8. Um, so those, those are, are a median tax increase and average statewide are actually very, very similar in, in dollar impact. So just a, just a base of, of comparison. So as uh, I've been stressing this evening, we do have a number of decisions uh, that will need to be made um, during, during this review process between uh, January and, and early March when we need to have a final, final budget for presentation. Um, uh, certainly dispatch is, is a critical issue. Um, if we are going to go in-house, we will need to add additional capital and operating funds uh, to the budget. Um, and same with if we want to add uh, police staffing and or fire staffing. Um, on the police side, really not an opportunity for grant money. On the fire side, there is opportunity, but only for, you know, in the initial three years. And then after that, there would be um, an impact to the budget. Um, and then the third area for staffing discussions is a reorganization of the health department, um, moving towards a, an in-house health agent um, uh, with, with staff, with um, clerical support. Um, 
Right now we farm that all out um, and we could bring a lot of that in house, um, but the, uh, there would be a net cost to us to do that. Um, so the Board of Health would like to um, uh, pursue uh, this discussion with you in the next uh, month or two. And as I say, we will get more details um, about what available um, assistance there is to do this. Uh, the new bill that was passed by the House and Senate and signed by the governor just uh, yesterday um, included a couple hundred million for increased support to local boards of health. Um, we don't know exactly how that is going to be distributed, whether it's all a competitive grant or is there a, a formula basis that all communities will be receiving. We just haven't heard those details yet. Um, so we hope to have that in the next few weeks. Greg, I'm sorry to interrupt. No, it's quite all right. Uh, with, with that, um, the, the help, is that uh, one time, is that from ARPA money or would that be an ongoing? Well, so um, the, the ARPA money is, is one time. So that, that would just help with some additional hours, for example, for the health nurse. But the state funding that, that is becoming available to the 200 million, again, we don't know if that's over a number of years and, and what their thoughts are for long-term funding of that. Um, so I don't have a good answer yet as to what that state funding will be and how, um, how long-term it is. It's uh, to be determined. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned, a little concerned about uh, if inflation continues at its current pace, we haven't really built in uh, that, that kind of assumption yet. Um, and I think the next, uh, next few months will be telling um, in terms of those inflationary pressures of how, uh, how transitory they are, or are they more permanent? And if they are more permanent, then we're, we're gonna need to do some re recalibrating. Um, and then finally, um, uh, some resiliency planning efforts. Uh, the, the capital budget does propose some, um, some dollars to support a new water resources task force effort to update our um, uh, analysis of our long-term, I'm uh, talking you know, 40, 50 year term horizon, um, try to get a handle on our water needs over the long term and what additional steps may be needed. Um, it's likely the task force will need some um, additional professional um, assistance in doing some of the hydrogeologic analysis um, that is, is necessary to make some good, good decisions along those lines. Um, so you'll see that in, uh, in the capital budget for some um, uh, engineering support for that, for that work. Um, and that's, that's a beginning. Um, I think resiliency planning and projects will, will um, slowly ramp up over the coming years. Um, again, there are some new dollars being um, put into that both at the state and federal level that we'll certainly try to uh, take advantage of when we can. Um, but it certainly will be a, a new area that we need to um, begin to put more attention uh, to it. I have a question. Yep, go ahead. Can you go back to the previous slide, please? Yep. Uh, is the uh, regional dispatch in this budget budgeted as reinvesting in-house, uh, level funded where it is now? Or so it's, how, is, how is that being dealt with within this budget as it exists? Yeah, as it exists, it's level funded. So it's status quo. I mean, it does have a slight increase for for salary increases, but it basically it's a, it's a status quo budget in the, in the current proposal. Okay, could that, that could change dramatically if the decision is made to keep dispatch in house. Correct. Or if the decision is made to go regional because either way it could ramp up or slide down some. Yes, it won't ramp down that much in 23 because it'll take, um, it might not take all of 23, but it will take the bulk of 23 to make the transition. Um, so even if you would decide to go to regional um, you know, in the spring, 
um, you won't see that much savings in, in 23. You obviously will see significant savings in, in 24, but, um, but not so much in 23. Okay. Thank you. Other, other questions at this point? We've just got, a, I think, one or two more slides and then we can open it up. <clears throat> Well, I'll do a follow on about that the, the call center. So you mentioned if we did go to the regional call center, we really wouldn't see much operational savings because whatever the time it takes to implement. But if it goes the other way, you mentioned that's more CapEx need, right? Upgrading, I don't know, whatever, radios, phones, right? Right. So right. my question is, what's, what's the ballpark number on that? Well, from an from a equipment perspective, it's, it's probably, um, you know, the 175 to 200,000 range for, for okay. capital needs. Okay. So let's say uh, I use 200,000 just to pick a number. Yep. I mean, given that we have a really big number planned in this budget for total CapEx, what is it, three, three, three five, three, six. six? Yeah. Right. So I guess where I'm going is, I got to believe it wouldn't be that hard, right? If you needed to, you know, switch it within that three six, right? In other and, words, right? There, there'd be some. There's, there's some, some uh, horse trading that can be done. Greg, right. aren't, you you also, aren't you also? Aren't you also assuming staffing increases? Yes. So then the other side is is, is staffing. Whether or not you want to go to, you know, so the. The, the, the one extreme, uh, I don't know, the one end of the spectrum is to have full two people on 24-7. Um, so that would, that's, that would basically double what our current staffing costs are today. So in, in, in round numbers, you know, that's, uh, that's in the $300,000, $350,000 range. Um, so Greg, is anybody advocating for that for the two people, or is it that a chief? Is the chief advocating for that? Certainly, certainly the fire chief would advocate for that. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so just. As I always like to say, you've heard it from me many times, uh, budgets are about choices. Uh, you know, what are we right sizing? You know, do we have the appropriate size uh, departments for the services that are being delivered, up or down? Um, you know, do we, are we providing the right services? W you know, would citizens uh, agree to changes or not? Are there things that we're doing that we don't need to be doing? Or and are there things that we aren't doing that we should? Um, and what's the right design? Uh, do we have do we have the right model? We're exploring two different models for dispatch in-house versus versus regional. Um, should we be scrutinizing other service models for other services that are delivered? Um, and then what about do we have the right mix of funding? Um, obviously, we're we're extremely slanted towards the residential. Tax base. That's you know 90, 96% of our tax base practically uh, is all residential. Uh, we have a very very small commercial base, um, but perhaps that's that's okay with folks. Um, we've talked about user fees. We've increased some. Um, it always it never hurts to look at others. Um, we had talked about um, a room tax uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, we pulled it off of the warrant because of COVID, because we were trying to shorten the, the, the warrant. Um, but we could be taxing um, uh, stays, you know, the Airbnbs of the world. Um, we could be collecting um, a room tax on those stays that would bring in some additional dollars. Um, so again, these are, are questions and, and decisions that we will be uh, debating over the next few months. And, uh, and ultimately the voters will, will make those choices about which, uh, which direction they want. Um, 
Hey, Greg, on the on the room tax thing, what what is quote unquote market meaning like do a lot of other towns already assess it or not many do or? Uh, yeah, uh, quite a few towns, particularly uh, more tourist towns certainly do. But yes, okay. yeah, it's, it's pretty, and, it's and, becoming more and more common. And I assume there's some kind of state, whatever, law regulation on how much you can charge, I assume? Yes, yes. Um, oh, what is it? <laughs> I want to say. Well, you know, my like, next question. You know, my next question. Then, just what's the ballpark? What do we think we could get for? Revenue? Yeah, I I don't have a good sense of that because we, most of our local rentals are not regulated, because everyone rents for longer than six nights, so we don't require any permitting. So we don't have a good sense of that. I mean, you could, you know, just go on the various uh, rental sites and see how many Manchester addresses you find. Um, hmm. So I, I don't have a very good sense of how much this could bring in. Um, I want right. to say it's a 3% charge, but I, I could be wrong. That's what I recall, 3%, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, this sound, we're going into the weeds at the moment. I'm going further into the weeds. <laughs> okay. If we don't know who's renting, how are we going to charge them? I mean, how are we, are we actually going to chase people down from, from Venmo ads? Well, we've actually done some of that <laughs> um, as part of the, you know, to see if they, uh, you know, so if we see someone who's running for less than six nights, we, we do chase them down um, and say, you need to get a permit. They typically respond, well, I'll just do a six night minimum. Um, so we lose them. Um, but they, um, there is a requirement, depending on, again, how, how often they're renting that they, they do register with the state. And um, so they, there's that, there's that registration already um, that most of them have to do. Yeah, thank you. I, I now that you mentioned, I do remember that there was some. We could go to the state, and the state would charge it basically free money. Right. So it actually is. It's all collected by the state, and then they they give us our a quarterly check. Is how that how the room tax works. So the we don't actually it, collect it. it. Is it through state, like the platform, like say Airbnb? Are they actually the ones that kind of collect Airbnb. it first? Yes. Yeah, they collect it first, and then they they turn it over to the state. And then and then got it, got it. Okay. Yeah. So that's I mean that's how the hotel tax works. Same way. And just to add one more comment, and while we're in the rabbit hole, um, Venmo is now um, reporting in anybody any payments over total of $200. So if anybody's trying to pay a room fee that way, that is going to be reported to the government as well. So finally, my last slide, just looking at next steps. Um, you know, now that we will, we will get you the information, um, we'll give you the access uh, to uh, the ClearGov platform. Um, you'll be able to start reviewing all of the data, uh, including the, the actual budget book. Um, we have tomorrow night, there's the presentation by the school committee on their preliminary budget. And then that'll be followed up by a second hearing that they'll have uh, end of January, 1st of February. Um, so January and February is when the finance committee is, is earning their big bucks and meeting <laughs> weekly and uh, reviewing uh, all the details, um, talking to different uh, department leaders as, as needed to re review requests and, and make sure we got full understanding of what's being required and requested. And then obviously we target to finalizing all of the, the budget numbers by early March and getting ready for what is assumed to be the uh, April annual town meeting. So a lot of information to absorb. I know that you didn't have a chance to, um, to review the booklets um, before we got started this evening, but this evening isn't really designed to go and uh, you know, deep dive. It's really just to give you this, this broad overview and highlight some of what I see as the um, key decisions and, and, and issues that we need to address as we go through the budget in addition to 
you know, the usual scrutinizing and, and making sure that the numbers make sense. Um, so it's really uh, an introduction to the new budget. And as I say, some of the issues that you should be paying attention to as you start into it and come uh, the first of the year, we'll, we'll do just that. We'll start diving in. Um, but I'm happy to answer any, any questions people have right now, um, understanding that you haven't had an opportunity to, to review and to, um, to digest any details. I've got a question, Greg. Uh, relative to the discussions that we'll, we'll be having for different staffing models for public safety, are there, are there or that we, consultants that we know of or can we look into some that might be able to provide us some, some guidance? I always feel woefully unqualified to really analyze those, those different models. So, um, I mean, the short answer is yes. We could we could reach out to some um, uh, to some consultants who could provide us some guidance and some uh, comparisons. Um, it's uh, it's it's helpful to obviously frame what questions you have and, and what particular areas um, before we bring someone on board. But we can certainly work on that. Thanks. Uh, Greg, got a question on, sure. um, on, on the dispatch. And we have a, um, an annual meeting, our, our, our town meeting in April. And assuming that that issue goes to a referendum in April, whatever the decision is, there could be some financial implications for that in this coming fiscal year, which you touched on a little bit earlier. Does the budget have some flexibility uh, to accommodate that? If say we've got to start to put, if, if dispatch stays here, we would want to start to put more money into that and that's not in the budget for fiscal 23. I understand if it goes out, probably not too much happens because it's status quo for the majority of fiscal 23. Right, so one scenario is that you would have, um, you know, option A and option B as a Warren article. Um, option A, go to regional. Option B, keep in house and appropriate an additional X dollars in order to bolster the in house operation. So you would be asking voters to approve one or the other uh, with a specific new dollar amount. Okay. Under each under each plan, I think that I mean that's certainly one way that you could handle it. Understood, and and I know we will have all of those numbers probably in the first certainly in the first quarter of this coming year, based on the study that's being done, etc. So yes, yes. Couldn't yeah. you also couldn't you also delay the enhancement a year so it doesn't impact the twenty twenty three budget? I, I mean, yes, obviously you could. You could you could be status. You could do status quo for another year. It's, it's, we've operated this way for a long time. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's a desire, obviously, to, to move one way or the other. I, I think in terms of both, um, both chiefs, that the um, software enhancements um, would be needed this year, no matter what. Um, and... Um, unless we were going to regional where that would be taken care of in the regional. But um, there's no point in delaying those software enhancements. It's a lot of important data in terms of how services are rendered. Um, the, the staffing, staffing uh, enhancement uh, needs to be considered for the variations that we could do with that staffing enhancement. Um, but that that would be something that would come out of the feasibility study to some extent, plus decisions that need to be made about what level of staffing we need. I don't think that we can delay the whole thing another year. But perhaps could delay the staffing piece. Uh, I think there'd be a lot of resistance to that on the fire side not just from the chief, but from the whole department. 
And doesn't that also include the staffing, um, how the state's changing um, the police who can, uh, the, the reserve police? I think that's separate. It is separate, but but the way the police are staffed right now, they have a lot of reserves, and so they caught they fill in for dispatch for quite a few of the um, uh, the the slots, and they're paid um, overtime. And if they're all full time police officers and not reserves, that's going to be very costly. Right, so there we're are... not going to resolve this one tonight. Right. <laughs> no. right. It, it seems that the fire, the, 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 the issue with dispatch is a little bit in our control. The police thing, uh, I know that Chief Fitzgerald is keeping an eye on when these rules are going to go fully in effect, but that's not so much under our control. When the state says this is what you got to have when, then things start to happen. Right, and, and they, are, they are behind schedule. With, oh, okay. With whole implementation. Yeah. So we'll, we'll have to see how that uh, evolves. So, Greg, this is Mike. You know, I'll file us under that same clause. You know, not going to get resolved tonight. But to me, I think for future discussion, I'd like to talk, you know, about that local receipts line. And, you know, I know we're a little less conservative, but in my mind, we're still pretty, pretty conservative. Um, especially when you mentioned what 2021 actual was. So um, that seems like a good opportunity there. Yep, yep, well, it's all on the table. So just to remind people, um, we plan to have the FinCom meetings in 2022 on Thursday night, starting the first Thursday in January, weekly. So I didn't have any other um, you know, details to present unless you wanted to spend a little more time going into anything that was mentioned during the overview, um, but really wanted to just tee things up, um, get things introduced and have you take some time between now and, and the first of the year to do some uh, casual reading as, as time allows. <laughs> and, um, and then we'll, as I say, we roll up our sleeves and, and get into the, into the, details uh, first of the year. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions if you have them now, or we can, um, your, your pleasure, we can call it a night and, and, and wait for, for those meet, future meetings to, to get into the details. Um, but as I say, we'll, we'll be sending out to you uh, the links so you can um, have full access to, um, to the platform. I'm happy to say thank you very much. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, and I, Eric, could you give us a, a preview of what the schedule is, not just the evening, but who's up first? I haven't determined that yet. I, I think I need to touch base with Greg on that. Um, I think that um, probably the first night we would go through an overview of the budget in its totality, and then we would be meeting with the major department heads over the next few weeks. So starting on the 14th? No. No? Wait a minute. Let me, I'm sorry. Let me look. I've got so many dates going through my head. Uh, really? <laughs> Shocking. I, so the first meeting would be on the 6th to go over the overview and then start talking to departments on the 13th. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm one day off. <laughs> That's <all> right. 
<laughs> okay. And I'll talk to Greg as to who, you know, who we deal with first. And part of that will be based on the overview that we have and, and the opportunity people have to look at that between now and January 6th, which is soon. <laughs> Very soon. <laughs> yes, it's all. <over. laughs> and unfortunately this year, we don't have as much time as we've enjoyed over the last two years that we know of. <laughs> I'll put in an early plug to think about a bylaw change that puts town meeting the 1st of May rather than the 1st of April. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> I, uh, I'm not sure of the history of making it the 1st of April, but that's something we could do a little homework on perhaps. I have a little bit of insight. Um, the 1st of April gives us enough time um, to prepare the warrant for the election and announce it. And if we go to May, then we have to figure out before the town meeting what needs to go on the ballot. Right. And that's what Essex does. And that's the argument that we've always had that we want to have a, a ballot that actually represents what the town meeting did instead of guessing. Yeah. Uh, you could push off the election, but that's another question too. <laughs> but we want to have the election the same time as Essex. Yep, yep. Well, with that, I'm happy to make a motion to adjourn the finance committee meeting. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Dean seconds it. I'll take a roll call vote. Andy? Yes. Dean? Yes. Mark? Yes. Mike? Yes. I believe Maury left um, and Sarah votes yes. Thank you. I'll take a motion to uh, adjourn the selectmen. Second. So moved. Okay, so seconded before it was moved. But we'll take it. Anne's, Anne's moved it and Becky has seconded. Roll call vote. Eli? Yes. John? Yes. Anne? Yes. Becky? Absolutely. And happy holidays to everyone. <laughs> and the chair yes, votes indeed. yes. Good night, all. Right, yeah, thank you Goodbye. all. Appreciate it. And Thanks very nice. much. And I Thanks, thank Greg. you. Looking yep. forward to having a little reading material to keep me sleeping. Yes, well. indeed. <laughs> yes. Along with all the policies, Anne. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody, take care. Thanks, Greg. Good night. Right. Thank Good you, night. Greg. Mm -hmm.